today's webinar. Um, what we're going to do is talk about the GS1 data bar for the Australian Mango Industry Association, what the Australian retailers are doing, the implementation to date, um, and how you can start um, and, and printing GS1 data bar onto your existing PLU labels. So I want to show you um, the agenda and the objectives of today's session is to understand what GS1 data bar is and how to apply it to your mango labels. So we're going to look at how to put um, a GS1 data bar on your label, how to allocate the numbers and use the GS1 company prefix that your company has been assigned or will be assigned and also how to check the quality of your barcodes to make sure that they scan first time every time. So the agenda for today's session will include um, a brief overview of GS1 and the GS1 system. Um, why GS1 data bar has been introduced, some of the considerations for you uh, as a supplier or as a shipper, um, and also talk about um, some of the data bar case studies that um, we have. So GS1 and the GS1 system is a system of standards and service if they don't know much about GS1 standards organisation. And GS1 standards, standards provide a global language of business. So a language for identifying products, capturing information about products automatically and accurately so that anybody that is receiving your barcode um, or using a common language about your product. Um, so within your own four walls, you may have your own internal codes or classifications. Um, and within the retailers four walls, they have their own method of identifying your products. So when using the GS1 standards, it's an open live standard within all open live trading environments that allow you to talk about the same thing, um, classifying you know, units of measure, is it a box or a bin or a carton? Um, all of those pieces of information have been um, identified in a standardized way. So it's you know, efficient, it, it's one method of labelling your product anywhere in the world. And when we talk about um, standards, we really just talk about an agreement between trading partners to use a common language. So GS1 Australia provides the GS1 numbering system within Australia to our members. We are a non-for-profit standards organisation um, and there's 111 GS1 member organisations around the world. Um, we look after over 150 companies, uh, sorry, countries across many different industry sectors. So you could sell your mangoes to the grocery industry and you could also sell it through the food service channels into old age care or mining facilities or correctional facilities. Um, so we have over 17,000 members here within GS1, within Australia and GS1 Australia administers and maintains the system of standards here in Australia. So I'm just going to talk about the standards in identification. So we provide um, and make it possible to identify, capture and share information automatically and accurately about products business locations, so the identification numbers can be applied across every level of packaging. The individual mango, the tray, the pallet, could even be the farm or the pack house or a cool room, um, so we can provide unique identification. GS1 standards, information important to growers and processors, packers, distributors and retailers is therefore consistent and re reliable. So it simplifies business transactions and enables efficient processes right from the orchard all the way to the farm, locally or globally. Um, so GS1 standards have been in use for a long time, um, but this is the first time we're seeing barcodes um, on a loose fruit item. So why GS1 data bar? This is the first barcode we've released in over 43 years. 
um, and GS1 barcodes have been um, adopted within Australia um, a long time ago. But now how we identify, label, sell and capture data of loose fruit and vegetables scanned at point of sale is, is changing. So with an introduction of a new barcode, um, we can see the evolution of the label has changed from purely just a, having a PLU number to identify that commodity and that variety. Um, we then moved to um, an EAN13 barcode like all of the other products around the world, um, you know, baked beans, tissues, shampoo, everything within a supermarket carries a GS1 barcode. Over 5 billion GS1 barcodes are scanned daily around the world. So it really is the only standard for data capture at point of sale. So now we're looking at a new type of barcode for that PLE label. And the reason that we're moving away from this barcode in the middle here, the EAN13 to data bar is purely size. So GS1 data bar barcodes will not replace the existing point of sale barcodes at point of sale. There is quite a lot of different data bar barcodes. The one that we are talking about today and the one that is being implemented in Australia for loose produce is the GS1 data bar stacked omnidirectional. So we've kind of taken a barcode, cut it in half and stacked it on top of one another to provide that um, sort of you know, shape that can fit on small, hard to mark items such as a PLU code. So I just wanted to show you the problem with the existing barcodes on a PLU label. EN13 barcodes um, are what we call omnidirectional point of sale barcodes, which means they can be scanned from left to right or right to left. Um, this means the symbol enters the scanner path in many different angles or distances and different speeds. So to overcome this difficult scanning problem, we have a minimum height designed for the particular symbol. So any barcode which is shorter than the specified height is what we call truncated. Um, this is something that we discourage from using at point of sale because it does not scan very well. You're not passing the line of the laser beam unless you scan it on every single different angle, which takes time in a very fast, high moving scanning environment. So therefore, the EAN13 um, barcodes on the mango labels, they don't scan very well um, and they're being discouraged from being used. Um, so we introduced GS1 data bar for two main reasons. One was to barcode products that are historically too hard, too small to mark. So fresh produce using a PLU sticker is seen as an early adopter globally. Um, the other purpose that data bar and the other problems that data bar can solve is that it can carry more data, um, attribute information, live information about that product, such as a use by date, a packaging date, batch numbers, serial numbers, weight, um, all of this extra information that can um, create a, a lot of benefits for consumers, for retailers and for suppliers. So this particular barcode with attribute data uh, is data bar expanded. We're not talking about that today and that is not what we're in implementing into the Australian grocery industry uh, yet. We may see them in the next three or four years on pre-packaged produce only. So the one we're looking at today, the omnidirectional stacked data bar is encoded on the existing PLU code. So with the introduction of data bar, um, we can provide suppliers, packers and consumers with specific, unique product identification. It delivers a lot of opportunities for increased efficiency in product authentication, traceability and quicker checkout times. So I'm going to go through some of the benefits for suppliers for you now. Um, so what we're seeing now with with data bar is that you can encode your own unique barcode number. And the benefits of having product 
movement data by grower and shipper, shipper is advantageous to both the buying and the selling community. So growers and shippers can now measure the success of their product at point of sale versus your competitors. You can therefore target marketing and demographic campaigns. You'll have exact, accurate sales data of when your product is sold. Buyers can then move away from a commodity-based category management, which is, you know, I am a Granny Smith Apple, I have this PLU code, and they can move towards unique product category management. So like all of the packaged goods in a supermarket does today. So you've got a unique number for your product representing your company, your variety. Um, you can simplify the flow of goods because you only apply one label and it will satisfy all of the Australian grocery industry as well as the global export market. You've got then full category management reporting item level sales, um, evaluating shelf merchandising, and then you can access this scan data and use this for a number of different things. Uh, you can also identify, we can also now identify specific suppliers of a multi-vendor produce item. Um, so by in identifying the specific supplier through the data bar barcode, you've got better control of sales versus receiving. You can use this sales data for trend reporting, forecasting and replenishment strategies um, are also enhanced. Um, at the moment, the, the inventory management at Woolworths is done on a variable nature. It's variable forecasting because they're not getting accurate sales. So therefore, with more accurate identification and sales data, we'll be able to provide you with better forecasting information for next season. Um, and, and we're anticipating a, an accurate forecast. And what that means for you is therefore better orders. Um, we're also looking at being able to reduce the price of, um, if there's um, you know, a product coming to a short shelf life, remo therefore removing waste from the supply chain and making sure that product gets through the store, out of point of sale and to the customer. With um, a barcode now identifying the grower or the shipper, we can now target faster recalls. We can target withdrawals and recalls more accurately, um, providing a, a safer food chain and safer food quality for consumers, um, which is saving the retailers a lot of money and they won't be able to sell, they can stop the sale of a recalled product. So for suppliers, there is a lot of benefits and our role at GS1 is to work with industry, to work with suppliers, to work with printers and the whole supply chain to ensure that we're creating one standard way of, of marking and identifying produce um, and to do this not just for the retailer, so not just because the retailer has asked you to do this, but also to get benefits out of, of having GS1 data bar. But for the retailers, they are going to have an improvement of service levels at self-scanning. So each product has a barcode, replacing today's generic PLU um, information. So scanning of loose produce enables accurate, fast point of sale activities. So at the moment with a self-scanning checkout, whether intentionally or not, consumers are entering the wrong produce item. Um, this is providing a lot of shrink, so for the retailer that's lost sales, um, incorrect sales, and it's also um, going to provide a enhanced category management for them for a wider range of products. So having barcodes and unique numbers on loose produce where we've never had this before. Um, there'll be an improved consumer shopping experience with faster checkout time. Uh, in the Woolworths project, we um, had results that showed a three seconds per produce item quicker scanning as opposed to manually looking up the visual lookup display. Um, so we're also looking at, you know, um, better fraud control, 
um, better shrink control, differentiating between organic and conventionally grown items. So that's quite a big savings for the retailers. Um, that you know they're losing millions of dollars in people scanning the wrong item, whether it's um, vine ripened tomatoes as opposed to field grown, or whether it's a queen garnet plum as opposed to a black plum. You know there's 10 difference per kilo difference between those two varieties, yet they look identical. Um, so this is what the retailers are looking at in, in their um, data bar implementation. So better traceability, targeted recalls, faster replenishment, making sure that your product is on the shelf at all times. Product availability, having the right product at the right time, the right place. And for the consumers, we have an increased speed at the checkout. So it's better customer satisfaction um, and creating a safer supply chain. With other data bar implementations yet to come, there'll be even more benefits to consumers where you could even link the scan data to the loyalty program, such as your flybys cards or your Woolworths rewards cards. So if there was a, an affected batch of a particular product, they could contact the consumer and say, you purchased this particular batch number of this product, um, there's been a recall or a withdrawal. So these are the sort of things we're looking at and the benefits to the supply chain and not just for the retailers. So I want to move now to some of the considerations and some of the technical specifications. So the how, the how to implement data bar. Um, so there is some changes. It is a change to the process that you currently do for your loose produce. Um, you know, there are things that need to be considered and I'll go through some of those now. So we appreciate that this may not be implemented at the start of the season due to the trade through of remaining industry colour coded PLU labels. So um, what the Australian retailers are asking is to advise them of the approximate carryover of the current coded stickers and you know an approximate implementation date for you and your supply date or your supply base. Um, if you do have any specific requirements about products or varieties, then um, you can contact your buyers within your trading partners to discuss. So what the Woolworths and Coles are doing are rolling out data bar on a category by category basis. So we had last season stone fruit introduced first to data bar. Um, we have now this season's apples and pears being asked to apply data bar. We have the mango category and avocados, ladyfinger bananas, this season citrus, followed by um, organic produce and imports are also being targeted. So the category managers with your buying team um, at your retailers will communicate when they want to see data bar. And the message is to exhaust your existing label stock. And then at that time, when you're re-evaluating your next print run to incorporate data bar as part of the, the printing process. So we don't want to be imposing costs. Um, so you, 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 know, you need to use up your existing label stock first. Um, so that brings us to the next point is to when you know you need to go to a new print run, um, you need to then redesign the artwork and add data bar. Um, and this is a great opportunity for you to, you know, add some of your branding, create a really great label. Um, you then, you know, will the PLU label that you currently have um, still be able to fit all of the information? Um, if you need to go to a larger size label, then, you know, there is an extra cost. Um, so allow sufficient time to redesign the artwork and talk to your label printers about this. They then need to schedule the redesign into the, their production process. So that may take, um, you know, may take some time to get artwork created, um, tested for quality assurance, and then redesigned into the production process. Um, and then are your printing cartridges in your printing um, applicators, are they able to take a bigger size label? So if you do have to go to a bigger size label, just to make sure that your printing environment is um, able and set up to take that label. Um, 
there's no need to go to a bigger size label. Um, but some of the stone fruit growers realise that the smallest label that they, is on the market does not um, accurately fit GS1 data bar. So just keep that in mind. And then you need to look at the numbers, the barcode numbers. Who allocates them and who manages them? How do you manage the numbers? Where do they come from and whose responsibility is that? I'm going to go into that over the next couple of slides. And education. So we're providing free data bar webinars on a fortnightly basis. The Australian Mango Industry Association has kindly put these two webinars on. Um, we, we're providing uh, resources on our website, um, how-to guides, and we're also educating the PLE label printers to, to be able to print good quality GS1 barcodes. So how do you get started? Um, we, we need to obtain a unique GS1 barcode. And to do that, you come to GS1 and we provide you with a GS1 company prefix. That will be the first eight digits of all of your barcode numbers and uniquely identify you as a company around the world. We have a number of different GS1 membership options, all based on company annual turnover. So to have a look at the fee schedule and what's right for your business, depending on how many products you have to barcode um, based on your company annual turnover, go to our website, www.gs1au.org, how to get started. There's a fee calculator that makes the process simple. There is a once-off joining fee, and the fees are based on what time of year you join. So you only pay from now until the end of this financial year on a sliding scale with the financial year. At that time, we would then re-invoice you for the next financial year. So it's an ongoing license um, um, cost. You then need to allocate numbers to your different varieties. Um, they are on a one-to-one -one basis with the PLU code. So if you currently identify different size breaks, you would and you would have different PLU codes for the different sizes, you would then have that amount of barcode numbers based on the PLU. So a one-to-one -one with the PLU code. So once you allocate your barcode numbers, you need to um, advise the trading partners what those numbers are. Otherwise, when the barcodes are scanned, there'll be no data on file and nothing will, will come up. There'll be no information that, that comes up. Um, so also look at your equipment, um, the redesigning process, the artwork and so forth. Uh, so that's a very, very quick how to get started. So I'm going to talk about the barcode number. And we call the barcode number Global Trade Item Number, or GTIN. It's a fancy word for barcode number. And we have a lot of different GS1 identification keys. Some of them identify produce, some of them, sorry, some of them identify products, point of sale products. Some of them identify non-retail, such as a tray of 12 mangoes. We have a different identification key for a pallet. We have identification keys for locations. But when we're talking about barcode numbers, we talk about GTIN. And the GTIN is just a number. It's a link or a key to look up all the information that's associated with it. So you manage and maintain the numbers, and the numbers are represented into a computer readable font, such as data bar. So we have lots of different types of barcodes, and the numbers are represented in that bar space pattern. Then when the barcode is scanned, it will decode that bar space pattern into a number, look up the number into the database for point of sale, or can store it in a, in a database for future lookup. So there's no magic in a the barcode, there's no information in a barcode, it's just a number. And the G10 is used around the world, and it has a number of different components. We have a GS1 company prefix, which is what you join GS1 for. It's an integral part of the GS1 system and is assigned to the grower or the party responsible for delivering the goods to the market. 
So what we've agreed to is that the pack house location will allocate a G10 for each variety. So we got together with the Australian and the New Zealand grocery industry and um, we created a standard message that it will be the person who applies the label responsible for allocating and managing these G-TINs. G-TINs for data bar are 14 digits long. And to make the G-TIN, we simply place a filler zero in front of the G-TIN 13. And I've got some examples in the next couple of slides on how to allocate them. The G-TIN is made up of a GS1 company prefix, a filler zero, an item reference number unique to the particular product, and a check digit. And the check digit is the um, last number of the G-TIN. It is part of the G-TIN and it is encoded into the barcode. So you can see on this slide, every different variant of an item, every different um, size of an item has its own unique item reference number. So we have a Kensington medium, we have a filler zero, we have our eight or nine digit company prefix, depending on your membership details. Then we have a three digit item reference number. So for this particular example, we've started at the beginning, zero, zero, zero. And once we have our item reference number, we can calculate a check digit. And I'll show you how to do that. The Kensington large, we have the same GS1 company prefix, unique to Melanie. And then we have a three digit item reference number for the different size. The check digits then recalculated and you have the 14 digit GTIN. So the next item, you just go to the next sequential number um, and that way it's easy to know where you're up to. If you ever need um, a, a new GTIN, it could be even for a prepack, you go to the next unallocated number. You need to keep these numbers on file. We don't know what number you've allocated your product to. So keep it somewhere safe, copy it, make a copy, back it up somewhere, tell everybody within your business, make sure not more than one person knows where these numbers are, and then communicate them to your trading partner. So to calculate the check digit, it's based on a mathematical formula. But to make it easy, if you go to our website, we have a check digit calculator program. You can go to number type, so data bar is a 14 digit G10. We enter the first 13 digits, including that filler zero at the start, and then we can press calculate and it will give us that last digit on the end of the barcode. And the check digit's there for a couple of reasons and it validates that the number is correct within the bars and spaces. So the scanner actually does this algorithm as it scans and if there's been a mistake in um, encoding the GTIN into the barcode, it just will not scan. So it's just a check character. So as I said before, we have rules as to who assigns the GTIN. And the GS1 Global Standard states that it's the brand owner who is responsible for the GTIN. But when we come to produce, we often have commodities that have no branding. So who's responsible for the GTIN? So as I said, we got together with Coles, Woolworths, Metcash, Harris Farm, um, Aldi, Costco, um, New Zealand Progressive and Foodstuffs and Countdown, facilitated by GS1 and the Produce Marketing Association. And we've agreed that um, ideally you want the G10 to be assigned as further up the supply chain as possible. So, you know, ideally the grower is, is the um, optimum, but for um, logistics purposes at pack houses, We've agreed that the pack house will allocate the GTIN and apply the, the barcode. Um, they may receive fruit from 12 different growers, but we now have traceability to the pack house, which is a lot better than what we had before um, as just one commodity. I even heard from one of the retailers that they just cannot stock more than a couple of varieties of mangoes because they cannot scan them and um, accurately sell them at point of sale. So by introducing data bar, um, they'll be able to range more varieties. So the G10 is um, allocated at Packhouse and the grocery 
industry have been working with the different associations in creating specific label designs um, across the industry. Um, so GS1 also works with different areas of the supply chain to make sure that um, the suppliers only have to do this once, you know, one label that will suffice for all the retailers um, in Australia, uh, New Zealand and even globally. So what we need on this label is the PLU code. Um, we need the packing facility specific GTIN, the name of the pack house. Um, some of the categories such as apples have colour coding, so they have green for Granny Smith, pink for Pink Lady, etc. And so you should be able to fit any other information on the label, such as your brand or country of origin as well. We have minimum sizes to make sure that the barcode scans correctly. Uh, so the smallest label, the smallest barcode that we can fit is 10.15 mil by 14 mil. Your barcode printers, your PLU code or your PLU label printers are aware of the GS1 standards and will print them to spec. So here's an example of the letter that went to the Ladyfinger Banana Growers. They have a specific label design. They want the banana logo, a variety type, the grower's name, um, the PLU code, and the GTIN. And letters were sent to apples, to um, ladyfingers, and also to stone fruit. Haven't seen one for the mango industry as yet, um, but the retailers will, will liaise with the industry and make that happen. So to ensure your barcode scans first time, every time GS1 has a barcode testing service, we can provide um, barcode reports on artwork. So before you go to print, before you sign off on the artwork, send your barcode artwork to us. We will give you an interim report based on artwork. You can give this to your retailers. This is how they load the GTIN onto their point of sale software. The interim report will last a period of six weeks. At that time, you will need to send in your complete PLU label. So we provide this barcode report. It provides um, interpretation issues so that everybody's talking the same language about your product, linking it to the GTIN. You can send your artwork to the email address on your screen. Um, and I will send these slides to Jessica to email to you so you'll have all of this information. Uh, we can only accept a PDF format. There's also a barcode order form that goes across with the artwork um, and that you need to allow you know, up to four working days. You get two free barcode reports per year per member. Um, so make sure you use your freebies before the end of the financial year. Uh, after two, then there's a fee of $32.50. So you've seen the GS1 data bar stickers. You now know what they mean and what the Australian grocery industry is asking for. Um, and the benefits that we're going to see is a safer supply chain with better traceability, traceability to the packing facility or even further to the grower. You'll have a unique GTIN which provides marketing information, category management, unique sales data, replacing today's generic PLU information. We'll have accurate inventory, so they'll have accurate sales, they'll have accurate inventory, which means better replenishment, increased product availability, and making sure that your product sits on the shelf. And we'll also have improvement of customer service levels and pricing accuracy uh, for the consumers. So GS1 data bar is here. It's taken us a long time to release a new barcode. And um, if you have any questions or need any help, we have a lot of resources, we have case studies, we provide edu education and training, and we can check your barcodes for quality assurance. You'll only be asked to do the barcode verification once off um, as a procedure to get your GTIN loaded onto file. So um, that's what I wanted to share with you today, and I thank you very much for attending. And I'm going to now open, the, the, so if you want to ask questions, um, please go ahead. So thank you very much for your time.